sunshine outside is beautiful. I, uh, I ventured out in my shorts yesterday, but I realized before I go out in my shorts, uh, after seeing Mike wearing his shorts this morning, that I probably should spend a bit of time in my backyard with my shorts on before I go out any more publicly with my shorts on, but uh, it is uh, incredible to have this great weather. Why don't you take uh, just a moment to, uh, to greet those around you and maybe share what your plans for, uh, for spring break are. We have just a couple of announcements uh, as we uh, jump into our service time this morning. And I'll talk over you, don't worry, it's okay, I'll just... Uh, <laughs> uh, anyhow, this morning, just want to let you know for, uh, in terms of our youth ministry for the next couple weeks, uh, there is no youth ministry and as soon as spring break is over, uh, that will kick back in again. 
And we want to remind you that uh, following the service today, I don't normally have coffee cups up here with me or drink coffee when I'm up here, but uh, following the service this morning is our Coffee Connect. I've actually put some of our AAC coffee in here, and uh, it's pretty good coffee that we have here. I haven't tasted the snack. When I leave here, I'll swing by the kitchen, and if there's any warnings to be made, I'll let you know about the snack uh, following that. But uh, we're looking forward to a good time just to uh, connect and to fellowship uh, again following the service this morning. Our scripture reading as we uh, enter into a time of worship comes from Romans chapter 1. Verses 16 and 17 we read, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Father God, as we gather in this place, as we come uh, before you, Lord, our desire is to meet with you this morning, both through our time of worship and through your written word in our lives. God, we pray that you would penetrate our souls and our heart and that you would touch our lives again this morning. In Jesus' precious name.
Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars and I hear the rolling thunder. Thy path throughout the and then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down, from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze and when I think that God his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden Gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to me. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God. shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my And on the 
cross, the work was finished. God, you poured out your life just to give us new life. Now from the lips of the forgiven, hear an anthem arise, cause Jesus, you're alive. You reign above it all Let all of heaven and the earth erupt in song Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one There is no higher name Jesus, you reign above it all Sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. And you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. And you sent the darkness running. Out of an empty grave, seated alone in glory, and told on the highest praise. And you sent the darkness around out of an empty grave, now seated. You reign above it all And let all of heaven and the earth erupt in song And sing hallelujah to the everlasting one There is no higher name Jesus, you reign above it all And there is no higher name Jesus, you reign above it all. Father, we look at the news. We see what's continuing to happen in the Middle East, in Russia and Ukraine, and now the chaos and anarchy that's in Haiti, what's going on in Nicaragua, what's happening to families, and uh, the world is a pretty dark and messed up place, and yet Paul spoke of this thousands of years ago. And so his words that we'll look at this morning, his difficult, challenging, and even painful words have come to fruition today. And we pray for our world. We pray for the church in the world that promotes and uplifts a crucified and risen God the Son, Jesus Christ, that you would bless them, speak through them, that your spirit would convict and convince people of the reality of Jesus Christ. We pray for those in our congregation. You know who they are who need a special touch from you, whatever that needs to be. You just pray, God, that they would know your faithfulness in their difficult circumstances. And now as we switch gears and worship through your word, we pray that you would open our minds and our eyes and our hearts to receive what you would want us to receive today from Paul's words inspired by God the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 1. And all of God's people said, Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy St. Patrick's Day. I see some green out there, but not a lot. I should have uh, planned ahead and kind of talked about St. Patrick today, but we'll have to do that next year around. But happy St. Patrick's Day. We're going to dismiss the kids. 
Uh, the nursery is open for infants up to age two. Uh, rooted kids ages three and four will go to room 102, and kindergarten to grade five will go into the gymnasium. Just a couple more announcements. Our, our next offering will be next Sunday, March the 24th, so plan to participate in that. If you would like to join our ushering team, we're going to put teams together because beginning in April, we're going to take the offering on the second and fourth Sundays of every month. It's helped to go back to taking offerings, and so we invite you to participate and, and serve in that matter. And just the word, Sunday school will resume Sunday, April 7th, following the Easter service. Easter comes very early this year. I don't like it. Families are away. I like it better in the third Sunday in April, but uh, uh, Sunday school resumes Sunday, April 7th. So this morning, we're going to speak on everyone worships uh, something, and Michael Law prepared that slide for me. Before we get to that, I want to just um, show you a few pictures here. I guess it would help, Ken, if I turned it on. That's my fault. There we go. So that's my grandson, Owen. And a week ago, he came over for dinner with his mom and two brothers. His dad was working late. And I noticed him sitting on the couch kind of like quiet. And he's an introspective kind of guy anyway. And I said, Owen, what's wrong? And he just shook his head like this. And then Missy, his mom, came over and said, well, he's got a loose tooth. And it's just about ready to come out. And so Missy said, Owen, can I just pull that out now? It's just like swinging back and forth like that. He goes, no, no, no. Well, they got home. Sure enough, an hour later, their tooth fell out. So to em embrace what he was going through and to not make him feel not like that he was all alone in this, I sent him this picture, <laughs> that uh, my tooth fell out too. And uh, he didn't get it at all. He didn't even laugh at it. But thank you for laughing at that picture. You could see the shiny... Um, a scotch tape on my teeth and I just put a felt and colored that out there. So anyways, um, a week or so ago, a week ago actually tomorrow night, uh, Walter and Maggie Redekop were kind enough to have my son Mitch and their grandson uh, Tyson Hunter over for dinner. Walter prepared prime rib, right Walter? Better than any prime rib you will find in the best steakhouse in Vancouver, Walter Redekop. Now, anytime I'm not a techie person, you know this, I still have a Blackberry, you're getting tired of hearing about that. I still operate upstairs on Windows 7. I haven't updated yeah, a laptop since 1921, you know, I'm just way back in the day. I rely on Brian and, and Stephanie and before that, uh, uh, Maris Henry to do all that stuff. So anytime someone who's older than me makes an attempt to adapt to media and technology, Walter, I totally respect it. So Walter was trying to set up this dinner with Mitchell, and for, he was using voice to text, okay? Rather than like that, he was speaking. So he somehow, his text message ended up with Tammy's phone and I'm not sure if Mitchell even got it. But here's just a copy of that. You can't see it right there. Hey, yeah, Mitch, it's Walter Rent-A-Car. <laughs> now, that's not Walter's fault. It's him speaking into that thing, Walter Rent-A-Car. So from now on, he is Walter Rent-A-Car here in the church. And if you go to the very bottom, he said, Mitch... I'm going to give you my telephone number. Yes, no, i got to ask Maggie. What, what I've got to ask Maggie? I, I need to ask Maggie. It went on for about uh, several sentences there, but Walter, good on you for trying, and we respect that so much. Okay. Um, why do we, why do you attend church on a Sunday morning or in some cases a Saturday night? I'm sure there's all kinds of reasons. Some would be you just come to see and visit with your friends, with our friends. Some of us go to church with our families, and we only see them on Sundays when we gather, Saturdays when we gather for worship. Some come to enjoy the music and to worship. Some might even come to hear the talk, the sermon. Uh, some, I think, at times come to church out of a fear that if we miss church on a Sunday morning or a Saturday night, God is going to bring misery into our lives. Or do we come because we have experienced 
the deep, amazing grace and goodness of God because God has done something so wonderful for us that we cannot do on our own. We're in Romans chapter 1, and I purposely had Brian read the previous verses leading up to this text because Romans 1 gives us an incredibly dark picture of humanity, of who we are. And yet this gives us the beauty and the brightness of the gospel. And so we start with this question. What is the gospel? What is the gospel? If you were to go to the house of James in Abbotsford, you will find and see hundreds of wonderful books there. Hundreds. But you will also see books with these, title, these kind of titles on them. Bible Prophecy Under Siege. Is Bible prophecy the gospel? No, it's not. It's part of underneath the umbrella of the gospel. You will find a book there called Do the New You. Every day of Friday, how to be happier seven days a week. Become a better you. Now, there's nothing wrong with these books. They are good, encouraging how-to books. But if we get to the core of the gospel, the gospel is really not a how-to. The English Standard Version of Romans 1.18 starts with the word for, for the wrath of God. Paul is writing that the gospel is necessary truth, not simply to make you and I happy and enjoy the grace and goodness of God, but also because there is such a thing as the wrath and justice of God that we all face. You cannot have grace and goodness and mercy without God's wrath and his justice. I, was show, I showed a video this week to Brian Wade and Ken Barron, uh, former Vancouver Canuck coach John Tortorella, this past week while playing in in Tampa Bay with his team, the Philadelphia Flyers, was kicked out of the game 10 minutes into the game. Now, that was a special game because in 2002, Tortorella won the Stanley Cup with the Tampa Bay Lightning, and they brought all those players back. So it was kind of a special night. They did a celebration and ceremony before the game. So 10 minutes into the game, they kicked him out. The referee kicked him out. For 90 seconds, and in that context, that's a long time, he refused to leave the bench. He used all kinds of expletives, kept saying to the ref, I'm not going anywhere. Drop the puck, drop the puck. He just would not leave. It's, the, it's hilarious to watch. Finally, he leaves, and the owner of the flyer said, I'll cover the fine. Well, he was fined $50,000 and suspended for two games, but that ref, whoever he is, number 34, was incurring the wrath of John Tortorella, <laughs> okay? You see, if we don't believe in and understand the wrath and justice of God, then the gospel will not inspire us. The gospel will not empower us. And the gospel will not move us. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth, suppress the truth by their wickedness. How do we define God's wrath? Let's keep it very simple this morning. His wrath is his settled, fared, and justified anger towards sin. God's settled, fair, and justified anger towards sin. Paul says it is a present reality. It's not going to happen when Christ comes back. It's happening today. Verse 18, is being revealed. And so this leads to two questions. Why is it being revealed? And secondly, how is it being revealed? Why is it being revealed? And how is it being revealed? And so let's start here. God's wrath, a breakdown in relationships. God's wrath, a breakdown in relationships against all the godliness and wickedness. God's anger first speaks to a disregard of God 
as to who he is and his rights as creator. So I looked up the word disregard in Webster's, and this is what it means. The act of treating someone or something as unworthy of regard or notice. Is the world paying attention to God? No. As treating someone as unworthy of regard or notice. And so this is a separation and breakdown of our horizontal relationship with God. That's how God's wrath is being revealed. Second, God's wrath, God's anger, speaks to a disregard of human relationships, of how we treat each other between us, human rights to love, to truth, to justice. And so this is a separation and destruction of relationships with those around us. Now, think of how Paul in Romans is connecting the dots to what Jesus said in Mark chapter 12. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Do we love God? Do people love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength? No. Do we love our neighbor as ourselves? No. So this is how the wrath of God is being revealed. Another question here. How can God hold someone accountable for not knowing a God they have never heard of? How can God hold someone accountable for not knowing a God they have never heard of? So we go to verse 21. For although they knew God... They neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Paul is saying that at one time, everyone knew better. We all know better because they do know the truth, but they do not acknowledge it. What does he say? Who suppress the truth. And so how does everyone at one time know the truth? Since what may be made known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. And so we all know, regardless of what we tell ourselves, that there is a creator on whom we are dependent and who we are ultimately accountable to. Now, we cannot know everything about God solely from creation. We don't learn about his love and his grace and his mercy, but we can begin to put together that whoever created all of this must be a being of incredible, unimaginable power and greatness. Right? But the Bible says... We suppress the truth. I'm paraphrasing Tim Keller now, but he writes, he, he writes that this is a countercultural teaching that Christians, to whom God's Spirit has revealed and shown the truth about God the Creator, are often accused of being repressed. People who don't know Christ accuse us of being repressed. What he means is that we as Christians are not truly being ourselves or opening up ourselves to the world as it really is. The Bible says that naturally we are all repressed. We are born sinful, separated for God, for as long as we deny the truth that there is a creator God. And as long as we deny this truth, we will never understand who God is, who we are, and why the world is as it is. So God's wrath is being revealed through a breakdown in relationships. Secondly, we either worship the creator or the created. Everyone worships something. Everyone worships something. Verse 21, for, all, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but in their thinking, be, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. 
nor gave thanks to him. Sounds to me like God's wrath is because of bad manners, nor gave thanks to him. Many, many years ago, I was at a Canucks game in Calgary, way back in the 90s, with Rick Raybuck, Sean Campbell, and Mitch Brooks. I am not a tough guy. I'm a lover, not a fighter. Brian's the fighter. He gets in fights outside, save on foods. You can ask him about that story after the service there. I am not a tough guy. The one or two fights I was in, one was I was playing for Karenport High School hockey team, and I got into a, more of a wrestling match with a guy. I kind of got him in a headlock and swung him on the ground and got on top of him. And we were a Christian school playing in the Moose Jaw City High School League, and one of my sister's friends named Paula came running down, jumped up on the glass and said, Kill him, Doug! Kill him! And I, the, guy, the guy said, you're Christians, aren't you? And I said, ah, don't worry about it. Like, I fight wrestling with you. You're Christians, aren't you? <laughs> Anyways, Rick and I were sitting in the second tier. Sean and Mitch were down in the first tier. This goes back to like 1993, 94. And there were four young guys sitting in front of us who, as the game went on, got more brave because they were consuming more alcohol. And we had a female, young female usher in our section. And with about a minute to go, they lit up their cigarettes. And, of course, that's a no-go. So she came down and she said, could you please put out your cigarettes? I know, I hate to say it, but can you go outside? They were so rude to her. They didn't listen to her. They were mean to her. They kind of mocked her. And she was just doing her job. So I don't know where this came from, but I said, hey, guys, you better listen to the young woman and put out your cigarettes. And they looked at me and said, oh, yeah, what are you going to do? And I stood over them. I stood up, and I thought, well, I could at least kick one in the teeth, you know. And I had Rick Raybuck there. Mitch wasn't too far away, and Mitch is a fighter. I said, well, you just find out what I'm going to do. And Rick said, what are you doing? <laughs> and for some reason, probably my guardian angel, the four of them just left. They didn't, there was no encounter there. And the girl came up to me shaking, thank you so much for doing that. Now I was shaking. I said, I can't, in my mind, I can't believe I just did that, right? Their bad manners... And the way they spoke to and treated that female usher incurred my wrath. I cannot stand that kind of treatment of other people, Christian or not. I cannot take that. Well, this is not what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 1. This is what Paul is saying. We take what God has made and we make it our own. We claim it as our own. We call the shots. We determine right and wrong. We determine who we are. We are not grateful because we do not accept what God has done for us and around us. I don't really need to illustrate this. Today we see and hear my truth, my tribe, my journey of self-discovery. Again, I don't need to illustrate this because we see and hear this every day. So what happens when people don't acknowledge, trust, and depend on God as God? This happens. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator. We change the object of our worship and our affection and worship something else. Whether a person believes in a creator God or not, everyone worships something, right? Our DNA, the way God made us, our makeup says that we must orbit around and worship something. So the gospel says, if we reject God, we will naturally worship something or someone else. Tim Keller, quote, there has to be something which captures our imagination and our allegiance, which is the resting place of our deepest hopes and which we look to to calm our deepest fears. Whatever that thing is, we worship it, and so we serve it. It becomes our bottom line, the thing we cannot live without, defining and validating everything we do. 
We either worship the creator or the created. Everyone worships something. Way back in Genesis, God saw all that he made and it was very good. All created things have good in them. So it's right for folks, for us, to find right things in them and to find them admirable and to enjoy them and to pursue them. Money is good, but when it becomes all-consuming, not so good. Sex is wonderful, but it becomes all-consuming, not so good. The problem comes when the created becomes above the creator and we give them our ultimate affection, which only God deserves and has the right to demand. We like to make a good thing, a small g God thing. And what happens? Go home and watch the news tonight. The created order gets undone and turned upside down. Take a look at the world today, upside down. Such a heavy talk. I'm going to try to use some humor here, but anyway. I don't know what possessed Tammy this week, but she got into our kitchen and she rearranged everything. I went down the other morning, put the coffee on. I go, oh, mugs aren't here. What, what's going on? We don't have everything. Everything was all. I was so discombobulated. Then later in the day, you know me, I get dizzy easy. So this is our cutlery drawer, and I'm pulling it out, and I'm looking right down on it. Okay? Normally, the cutlery's this way. But Tammy changed it this way. So when I look down, I go, ooh, ooh. So I have to move, turn around the side, and pull it out that way. Everything in the cutlery drawer became upside down because Tammy changed it around. Now, that's a really crass illustration to illustrate what's going on in the world today. We are worshiping created things and not the creator because everybody worships something. Folks, we are uniquely made in the image of God. This is what separates us from all the other created beings. We are made uniquely in the image of God, and we are made to relate to him and reflect his character to each other and the world and how we live. And so how has all of this happened? Verse 21, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Since the truth about God is being rejected and ignored. Life simply cannot be lived in a consistent way. Agreed? It just cannot be lived in a consistent way. Theologians say it like this. In the case of morality, if there is no God, who has the right to say what is right and wrong? How are we to find moral absolutes? How arrogant, folks, is it to say something like this? This is wrong because I say it's wrong. This is wrong because I say it's wrong. If there is no God, there is nowhere to locate the authority to give a moral absolute, but here it is, folks. No one regardless of their worldview, and I mean no one lives as though there is no right and wrong. They may say that they do, but they don't. Because when they are wronged, <laughs> they cry out for justice. Right? They do. They cry out for justice. And so we either worship the creator or something created. Everyone worships something. And then we come to this. The wrath and consequences of over-desire. The wrath and consequences of over-desire. Verse 24, therefore God gave them over. In a way, God's judgment in our denying him is what? It's to give us what we want. It's to give us what we want. He gave them over to the sinful desire of their hearts. And, and this is what happens. The things that we choose to orbit around other than God, the things we serve, they will not free us. They will not free us. They will end up controlling us. 
Because we are created to center our lives on and around God, who is the only true provider of purpose and fulfillment, these created things do not fulfill and satisfy because we will always feel like we need more or we will turn to something else. Keller, one more, well, second last time. The tragedy, he writes, quote, the tragedy of humanity is that we strive for and fail to find what we could simply receive and enjoy. We suppress the truth which would free and satisfy us. Now, the NIV uses the words sinful desire or sinful desires. The English Standard Version uses the word lusts. If you put sinful desires together with lusts, it literally means over-desire, over-desire, an all-controlling drive and longing. So I think this is quite revealing, right? The core issue of our heart is really not a desire for bad things, but our over-desires for good things, turning created good things into God's. And this can be the worst thing, right? And this is what God has given us, humankind, over to the over-desires of our hearts. I could use so many examples here, but I'll use a safe one, career, vocation. If we over-desire our career above all else, if we over-desire our career that it will make us into somebody, it drives us. Our career will dominate our life. Everything else and everyone else is fitted around our career. What's the worst thing that can happen to someone who has an over-desire for their career? They get a promotion. Because this will allow them, this will allow us to continue to think that we can find blessing in our over-desires. It empowers us that this, in fact, is real life and enables us to forget the potential wreckage that we are making of our marriage, of our family, of relationships and friendships in order to pursue our small g God. And so this is the wrath of God, to give us what we want too much, to allow us to pursue things that we have put in place of him. And when we live this way, and the world certainly is, it sets up stresses, strains, disorders, and toxin in the order that God created. Instead of finding peace and forgiveness and redemption and, and, and reconciliation and redemption and restoration with our creator, our sinful over-desires cause breakdowns spiritually psychologically, mentally, emotionally, socially, and physically. God gave them over. So let's land the plane here. They exchanged the truth of God, about God, for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen. So this is also doom and gloomy, right? We had a board meeting a while ago where things got a little passionate about coming to church and all this sort of stuff. And we, one, one of our elders said, I come to church to forget what's out there and to be lifted up in here. You came here to forget what's out there <laughs> and to be lifted up while here. I get that. So what's the answer? Well, Paul gets to the real answer beginning in Romans chapter 3 but we got one and two to work through. But verse 25 that I just had on the screen gives us a tiny little bit of a hint as to what the solution is. He writes, who is forever praised, amen. Who is forever praised, amen. So what's the answer? Well, praise God as God. Treat him with the respect he rightfully deserves. Praise God as God. Worship God in spirit, in reality, and in truth. Desire God more than you desire anything that God has created. Where do we find the power to do this? 
at the cross and at the empty tomb that is far away from God that we once were or can be. In the person and work of God the Son, Jesus Christ, we are loved and accepted and blessed far beyond our imagination. Through the cross and the work of Christ on our behalf, we stand before an altogether holy God, a God of wrath and justice. But we stand before him only because of Christ, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, right with him and deeply loved by him. Jesus in you is the hope of glory. His righteousness, his holiness, his perfect obedience, his perfect life becomes your life when you acknowledge his rightful place in your life by confessing not the sins of the world, but your own sin. And you believe on the person and work of Christ and then you receive him into your life. Righteousness, holiness, perfect obedience, perfect life becomes yours. And that's why we don't have to fear God. Now, knowing all of this, why would we treat that and just throw it all away? We won't. I'm going to Steve and the team to come and to lead us in a closing song here. But as they make their way, do you have time for one more Keller quote and then a word of prayer? I read this quote just a few weeks ago. Just listen to me. You don't have to watch who's walking up here. I love that. It happens just about every time. <laughs> the gospel, Keller's words, the gospel is that I am so sinful that Jesus had to die for me, yet so loved and valued that Jesus was glad to die for me. This leads to deep humility and deep confidence at the same time. I can't feel superior to anyone. I can't feel superior to anyone, and yet I have nothing to prove to anyone. End quote. Amen? Let's bow in prayer. Father, Paul's words in Romans 1 and 2 challenging, but they, are, they have certainly come true today. And so for those of us who are clothed in the righteousness of Christ this morning, we are humbled, we are grateful, we are forever forgiven, empower us by your spirit to reflect his character in here, out there, 24-7, seven days a week, 12 months of the year. Empower us with your spirit, the great Holy Spirit, whose sole purpose is to uplift the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so we thank you, God the Father, for God the Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit, who are very much a part of who we are as individual Christians, and especially together as a body of Christ. And so we stand together now, and we worship this great Jesus, the freedom of Jesus only in the midst of all of this darkness. In God the Son, Jesus Christ's name, we pray this, these things. Amen. Let's stand together and sing together. There is a truth i
invite you to stay behind for Coffee Connect. You can introduce yourself to Walter Rent-A-Car. Uh, maybe you have a prayer need or you have a question about the talk this morning. We invite you just to come forward and chat with myself or Pastor Brian after the service. But as we begin these two weeks of spring break and we're heading into Easter, Good Friday and Palm Sunday next Sunday, the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen, church. Amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful break.